Good morning. Uh, my name is Salman Rafe. I'm the program manager here at the Mitchell Institute. Um, we're glad to all have you here at a packed house for a, a lunchtime seminar. Um, I just wanted to highlight that um, this is actually our last fellow seminar uh, of the semester um, our, our, for one of our standard fellows as well. We have more programming along the way, but um, our fellowship program is one of the highlights of the Mitchell Institute. It allows us to bring uh, an extremely diverse, extremely talented a uh, unique set of scholars here to campus. And that's not only a benefit to them to be able to connect with all of us and access Harvard, uh, but also really for all of us, it's an opportunity for us to hear from some of South Asia's brightest emergent scholars. Um, and so we've had a, a sweep of fellow seminars over the past year. We've had a record number of fellows. And so this is a nice one to cap it off with. Um, in particular, you know, this fellowship, the, the Bob R. Lee Fellowship is uh, made possible thanks to a very generous support from Said Bob R. Lee, who's been one of the Mitchell Institute's longest and most supportive partners. Uh, and that allows us specifically to focus on scholarship from Pakistan. Uh, it allows us to bring a scholar from Pakistan here for half a year each year. Um, and so this is just a very exciting time for us to uh, highlight, again, one of Pakistan's best scholars. Um, so before handing things over to our actual presentation, um, I just want to thank and introduce a, a few people as well. Obviously, Hitesh Hathi, our executive director, is here in the back as well, who's quite a fan of the work. Um, and also uh, a special shout out to Danielle Walner, who oversees our fellowship programs at the Institute, can't be here today, but sends her regards. Um, and I'll just finally start by introducing and thanking our uh, fellows faculty mentor. Um, these faculty mentors work with our fellows throughout the fellowship program and give them guidance while they're here at Harvard. And they also serve as their uh, seminar moderators. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Ali Asani, who's probably not a stranger to many people in the room or the Institute. He's been a longtime partner and friend of the Institute. Uh, Professor Asani is the Murray A. Albertson Professor of Middle Eastern Studies and Professor of Indo-Muslim and Islamic Religion and Cultures here at Harvard. Um, he previously served as the director of the Prince Al-Walid bin Talal Islamic Studies Program at Harvard and has taught numerous courses at Harvard since 1983 on a range of topics about the Islamic traditions of South Asia and Africa. To fully list all of his accomplishments and works would probably run the length of the full seminar, so I'll, I'll just be brief and say that we're just glad Professor Asani has been able to serve as a uh, faculty mentor with us this year. Um, and as a moderator for this session. So thanks, Professor Asani, and I'll turn things over to you. So can I go from here? Yeah, no, please. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah so um, uh, thank you so much uh, for organizing the Lecture Lecture Institute, for organizing this event. Uh, for me, it's been a particular pleasure to uh, to have worked with Mariam uh, during the course of this uh, semester. Um, and uh, we've had many conversations uh, about the topic that she's going to be presenting. Uh, and then interestingly, she's also been sitting in on my course on understanding Islam and contemporary Islam societies, where we really talk about Islam. This, you know, there's no single story of Islam, there are only stories of Islam. And in an interesting way, it connects with uh, what she's, she's trying to work on. Uh, so just a little bit of background for Mariam. Uh, um, she is uh, uh, in Pakistan. She serves as an assistant professor and coordinator, uh, Department of Social Sciences, uh, Lahore School of Economics. Uh, her PhD from University of Sussex uh, was the first book length study of the English translation uh, of the Indo Persian classic, the one more volume, Dastani Amir Pansa. She translates materials from various Urdu resources to lend theoretical grounding to the study of an indigenous genre that has only been conceived through Anglophone approximations in academic settings outside, uh, uh, outside of South Asia. Um, during her fellowship at the Mittal Institute, Mariam has been translating the first volume of Shamshur Rahman Faruqi's multi-volume study of the 46th volume, Dastani Mir Hamza, uh, uh, and um, titled Sahiri Shahi and Sayyid Kirani, Dastani Amir Hamza Kamatla, a sorcery, magic, kingship, a study of the adventures of Amir Hamza. Uh, before beginning her PhD at uh, Sussex, Mariam worked for Pakistan's first English language news channel as an assignment editor for the Punjab region for five years, where she reported on terrorism, health, and education. 
our research interests uh, include theory and culture, the uncanny, and she'll explain what the uncanny is, um, storytelling and translation. Her work has appeared in the Oxford Literary Review, the South Asian Review, and the Journal for the Fantastic in the Art. So with that, I will hand it over to Mariam and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Asani. And um, thank you, Mittal Institute, for um, giving me this opportunity to discuss my work here. Thank you for everybody for coming to my talk as well. Um, I'm so glad to be part of this vivacious and fun group of postdoctoral fellows and very kind colleagues in management here at the Mittal Institute. So thank you for that. And I would like to say thank you also for taking care of my daughter, Zara, with me like your own. Um, and this work really wouldn't have been possible without all the support I've had from all of you here. Okay, uh, first things first. So uh, if you'd like to ask me a question which refers, which is like a short question, um, which, is, which requires a clarification or something, I'm happy for you to interrupt me and ask me that question. Uh, but for the longer, more discussion-oriented questions, uh, we wait till the end. Um, also, uh, before putting myself out there, I'd like to say that I've always approached the Dastan from departments of either English and English literatures and languages or through departments of social science. And I've never actually been a part of a South Asian department or a Middle Eastern studies department or an Islamic history department. Uh, and this gives me an opportunity to discuss my work uh, with all of you who have expertise in those areas where I might be lacking. So bear with me. For those of us acquainted with the Dastan and Kista genre, or those of us who have been interested in the Arabian Nights, it is a foregone conclusion that these stories do not end. But if they don't, what does it say about beginnings? I would like to begin my talk from where this version of the Dastan ends. May the beneficent God bless this translator and transcriber as a sacrifice of Prophet Muhammad. Praise be unto him. Martyr tooth and the wounded foot of Ali. May God have mercy on his soul. May he release him from dependence on everyone in this world and grant him his beneficence by divine will. And may the truth and fiction of this tale be attributed to the inventors of the legend. This statement for me encompasses the totality of the Dastan genre. The truth is in jeopardy, the beginnings are in the legendary past, the original language is long forgotten, and the end is at God's blessed mercy. The human is absolved of responsibility, and the Dastan Go is the ingenious figure who keeps the yarn spinning. This wish of the Dastan narrator in the context of the story is preceded by the martyrdom of Hamza at the Battle of Ohad. The Prophet Muhammad leading his funeral prayers and dissuading Hamza's half jinn daughter, Quraysha, from seeking retribution by showing her the lofty status Hamza had attained in the heavens. It is narrated that it was at this moment that Surah Jinn, the 72nd chapter of the Quran, was revealed to comfort Quraysha's heart. This last story from the text that I study might give the impression that this is a historical narrative about the early days of Islam. However, this is not true. Through centuries of being adapted into narrative traditions and art forms, especially through the Indo-Persian oral storytelling genre known as Dastan, history and fact have been subsumed into the fantastical. It is thus that I seek to theorize Dastan and Miramza as a narrative that defies our conventional understanding of what it means to use the words history and fiction. I see the Dastan as a, I see the Dastan, sorry, uh -huh. as a culturally inclusive space for storytelling that despite its Islamic connections does not privilege religious identity over the historical or even the fantastical. The profane, so to speak, does not reject the sacred and religiosity is not threatened by cultural inclusivity. Dastani Amir Hamza is representative of the storytelling tradition that existed outside the cordon of divisions. It is important also to understand how this initial religious nature of the Hamza story 
oriented itself towards alternate imaginings of narratives that did not privilege or appropriate particular stories or dichotomies. Storytelling in the genre transcends contemporary notions of religious identity. In my previous work, I have used Sigmund Freud's 1919 essay, The Uncanny, to contend that such uncanny spaces within the Islamic belief system help the storytelling tradition of Dastan Goi or Dastan narration to develop as a genre. I didn't have time to go into the detail of how I use the word uncanny, but we can talk about that at the end of the talk. I seek to express as I seek to stress the importance of reclaiming these spaces for a deeper, more nuanced understanding of the Islamic belief system through storytelling. In a potentially greater scheme of things, this will allow a debate on issues confronted by the Muslim world today that get so enmeshed with religious identity that they no longer remain open to critical inquiry or negotiation. I hope that we can bring these preliminary and hopefully thought-provoking remarks to bear on the way we tell stories today. Hailed as the Iliad and Odyssey of medieval Persia, Hamza Nama or the Adventures of Amir Hamza, Lord of the Auspicious Planetary Conjunction, is a narrative built around the life and times of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of Prophet Muhammad, who lived in Arabia from 566 to 625 Common Era. The most extensive version of the story, written by various storytellers of the time and first published by the Naval Kishore Press in Lucknow, India, between 1883 and 1917, is an Urdu Dastan spread over 46 volumes averaging a little over 915 pages each. The 2007 Adventures of Amir Hamza, Lord of the Auspicious Planetary Conjunction, is the only complete and unabridged translation of the one-volume Urdu Dastan text by Ghalib Laknavi, written in 1855 and expanded by Abdullah Gil Bilgirami in 1871. I'll leave you with these while I narrate the story. The Hamza of the Dastan is a follower of the Abrahamic tradition who serves the emperor of the seven climes, Nashirwan the Just, in Tessiphon. Hamza conquers vast expanses of land and quells rebellions across India and China, not only through the agency of his prowess, but also thanks to the divine gift bestowed upon him by prophet Adam, so that his arm will never be lowered by any adversary nor will anyone ever pre prevail against his arm's might. So if you'd like to see, this is Hamza. And as is usual with these paintings, his face has been scratched. But this is Hamza, and these are the days he fights, and he always wins. This sets the stage for an enduring conflict between the followers of the true faith and the fire worshippers in Nashirva's court. The conflict is also fueled by Hamza's betrothal to Nashirwa's daughter, the much sought after Princess Meher Nigar. While waiting for an auspicious alignment of the heavenly bodies for the nuptials, Hamza moves to the land of Kaf, a realm of jinns, paris, and devs, to help Emperor Shahpal bring the mighty jinn back under his rule. The 18 day journey turns into an 18 year separation from Meher Nigar who is protected throughout these years by Hamza's trusted aide, confidant, and milk brother, Amar Ayar, the master trickster. While in Kaf, Hamza marries Asman Pari, who gives birth to a half-human, half-jain daughter, Quraysha. Many battles into the listens later, Hamza returns with his three-eyed steed, born of a Pari and Dev, to earth. His journey is aided by the mythical Simurgh and by the prophets, Khizr and Elias or Hadir and Elijah. The one volume Dastan Amir Hamza ends with Amir Hamza's martyrdom while fighting for the forces of the true faith until under Prophet Muhammad at war. While in the longer 46 volume Dastan Amir Hamza, the connections between Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and the eponymous hero of the tale may have been completely severed, but in this one volume cycle of stories, the layers of fiction are still not deep enough to entirely obscure the connection. In fact, some theorists have gone to great lengths to discuss how any connection between the two is either improbable or not needed. The author of the book I'm currently translating for my fellowship here, Shamsur Rahman Farooqi, is also of the same opinion. 
While I understand this connection to the longer cycle of stories, given the context of the one volume Dastan, I argue for the need to keep this connection as it helps us see how stories can indeed remain outside of this sacred profane dichotomy. The martyrdom of Hamza is perhaps one of the most oft-repeated stories of heroism in the surface of Prophet Muhammad. In his introduction to the more famous and critically acclaimed Hamza Nama miniature paintings of this storytelling tradition, published in 2002, John Saylor writes that Hamza's extraordinary valor and ignominious defiling of his corpse have burnished his memory in the popular imagination as both hero and martyr. The historical story of Hamza's martyrdom is recorded in many original sources. Hind's avowal to kill Hamza in retribution for his killing of her father, Utba, in a single combat at the Battle of Badr a year earlier, 624, is presented by William Muir in his Life of Muhammad from 1854 as follows. Many acts of barbarous mutilation were committed on the slain. Hind gloated over the body of her victim, Hamza, tearing out his liver, she chewed it, fulfilling thus a savage vow. And she strung his nails and pieces of his skin together to bedeck her arms and legs. However, Muir is quick to note that tradition delights to abuse Hind as it did Abu Jahl. And we must be aware of the patent tendency to exaggerate. Karen Armstrong refers to this incident in her book, Muhammad, a prophet for our time, as follows. Hind had always hated Muhammad. She had lost her father, Utba bin Rabea, and two of her sons at Badr, and she had vowed to eat the liver of Hamza, who had slain Utba in single combat. One of the Quraysh split open Hamza's belly, tore out the liver, and brought it to him, who chewed a morsel of it to fulfill her vow. Then she started to chop off Hamza's nose, ears, and genitals, urging the other women to do the same with other bodies. They left the field wearing grisly bracelets, pendants, and collars to the disgust of the Bedouin and some of their own men who felt that this had polluted their cause. From this one kernel of fact, that of Hamza's martyrdom, we can glimpse the similarity with the Dastan tradition, which presents Hamza's killing as follows. Hinda had laid an ambush along Hamza's route to Makkah and was hiding with her army. She attacked him from behind and dealt a powerful thrust of her sword which severed all four of Ashkar's legs. Um, as Amir Hamza was taken by surprise, he fell to the ground when his steed collapsed. The accursed woman dealt a blow of her poison lace sanguinary sword, sanguinary sword to Amir, Amir's immaculate head and decapitated him. She cut open his abdomen and plucked out and chewed up his heart and then cut up his body into 70 pieces. Afterward, when her terrible folly had become apparent to her, she feared the retribution Amir Hamza's daughter Quraysha would visit on her with the help of the devs and jinns of Kaaf. The fear drove her to take refuge with the holy prophet. She shed bitter tears before him and repented her actions and converted to the truth. Hamza converted to Islam in 615 CE after six years of opposing his nephew's call to worship one God. The story of his conversion is considered of extreme historical significance in the context of the spread of Islam. And Muri writes, the gain of Umar and Hamza was a real triumph to the cause of the spread of Islam, both possessed with great bodily strength and indomitable courage, which added to their social position, secured an important influence in Makkah. The combined factors of his complete and utter faithfulness to his nephew, his courage, social stature, and then the macabre circumstances of his death made the Hamza story susceptible to layering and exaggerations. This functioned in elevating Hamza's stature and by contrast, depreciating the anti-Hamza and hence anti-Islam forces of the time in equal measure. Hamza's conversion and the fulfillment of Hind's avowal following his martyrdom are presented in the film, The Message.
So yeah, so we see that there is a little difference between how it's narrated in uh, history, how it's narrated in fiction, and how it is narrated in the film. So we already see um, how the different mediums or who tells it will change the story. While any historical connections between the fictional and the historical Hamzas have been dismissed by the theorists of Dast and Amir Hamza, in light of the various sources, I argue that the reasons for the denial are not empirical, but rooted in the negation of profanities in connection with religiously venerated personages. A curious incident is recalled in Gyan Jain, Chand Jain's Urdu ki Nasri Dastane or Prose Dastan of Urdu about the history of the Hamza name as used in the Dastan. Jain's maternal grandmother mother told him that when the Dastan go first wrote the Hamza stories, they were indeed about Ali ibn Abu Talib, Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law and one of the five holy personages in Islam. However, the storyteller dreamt that Ali chided him in his dream and threatened him with dire consequences over the web of lies and deceit that he had built around his name. The Dastan Go was so scared after seeing Ali in his dream that he woke up the next morning and changed the name of Ali to Hamza. In the, it is in this very rejection of a historical connection on part of the theorist of Dastan Amir Hamza that my argument takes root. Profanities could not have existed if the Dastan was to remain manifestly a story about the historical Hamza, as that would indeed be akin to blasphemy. The Dastan Goals realized that this would not bode well for their trade. They needed a story that could easily cross over from the sacred to the profane and vice versa. This they did by inventing transmitters and then placing the onus of responsibility of the truth and fiction of the narrative on them. This they seem to have done by removing the evidence of the religious and historical from the profane stories within the adventures. The second reason has to do with the difference between the one volume Dastan Emir Hamza and the longer 46 volume Dastan Emir Hamza, which was developed solely in the subcontinent. This longer cycle, which was first written and developed uh, in India, left the historical figure of Amir Hamza as merely a reference point, a figurehead for the Dastan Go's trade. In fact, most of the volumes of the longer cycle of the tales, the original Sahib Kiran no longer makes a physical appearance. These two reasons are not mutually exclusive. The profane elements of the story were a result of the Data and Goi tradition. The simultaneous existence of the profane and the sacred does not seem to be problematic in any way, if indeed this was giving rise to a debate with reference to the sinful. There was nothing stopping the Data and Goes of the time from completely, completely eschewing Hamza's connection with the prophet and still exalting him as a hero. The heroic stature that had been achieved by Hamza of the Dastan tradition would not have undergone a change, even if that connection had been completely severed. A testimony to this fact is the longer cycle, cycles of the Hamza story. However, the Dastan goes saw no reason to reject this connection. This knowledge has two didactic purposes and a rather sobering thought for the Muslim world today. First, that these stories should and can remain outside the sacred realm, despite oblique connections. And second, that there is a strong history of storytelling in the Islamic world that can be held open for inquiry and study for a deeper understanding of the problems faced by the Muslim world today. We're probably moving on to better stories, perhaps happier, more interesting. The stories from the oral narrative tradition follow a general division into four basic types as expounded by Ghalib Laknavi in his preface to the 1855 edition of the one volume Dastani Amir Hamza. Razm, warfare, bazm, courtly assembly, tilism, magical enchantment, and ayari or trick. However, globally, the most popular documentation of the Hamza story is not the Dastan text, but the Hamza Nama miniature painting folios that are the magnum opus of Mughal Emperor Jalaluddin Akbar's art studio, painting, painted between 1562 and 1577. So we've been looking at those very paintings. It's just that uh, they keep talking back to the, to the story. <laughs> The original 1400 miniature paintings out of which less than 200 survive today have been studied by art historians for many years and are considered one of the most important depictions of Mughal miniature art. Each of these paintings came with mnemonic story texts written in Persian, 
And all of these have been published in John Saylor's The Adventures of Amir Hamza, Painting and Storytelling in Mughal India, and all available text has been translated into English by Wheeler Thaxton. So I have a copy of that catalog here. So after the talk, if anybody wants to look at the stories or the paintings, um, you're welcome to do so. The gods looking after the Hamza Nama paintings uh, have been more benevolent than those looking after the idle tales of the storytelling tradition. Folklore has it that when Nadir Shah ransacked Delhi in 1739, the only three things that the Mughal emperor of the time requested back were the Kohinoor diamond, the peacock throne, and the Hamza Nama. Nadir Shah refused to give the Hamza Nama back. He said, you could take the Kohinoor and the peacock throne, not the Hamza Nama. The triumph of Islam is the elite motif of the Hamza legend, writes Sela. The stories of the Hamza legend are often linked by elements other than chronological time, which has had a much stronger grip on our own sense of events than it ever did in the realm of myth. However, despite this general emphasis on the Islamic, Mughal Emperor Akbar was able to associate himself with historical, um, sorry, historical, mythical, and spiritual kingship that did not follow strict, strict injunctions of religion. In his 1594 letter to Shah Abbas of Iran, Akbar wrote, as it has been a disposition from the beginning of our attaining discretion to this day, not to pay attention to differences of religion, variety of manners, and to regard the tribes of mankind as the servants of God, we have endeavored to regulate mankind in general. According to Ebba Koch, this questioning of established religions and institutions at the Mughal court did not represent, and I quote, an isolated, isolated elite moment, unquote, but was a result of the influence of the Sufi orders and the Bhakti sects in 16th century Indian society. Despite the Islamic motif, it is difficult to see a narrative tradition that disparaged all other faiths and beliefs in favor of the Abrahamic tradition as the ultimate reality. In the Mughal court of Akbar, the following of Dine Ilahi, or the religion of God, that brought together all faiths, this would not have been possible. One clue to this apparently dichotomous relation might be the fact that the relationship between Islam and the true faith is not made explicit in the text that accompanies the Hamza Nama paintings. It is a similar or all-encompassing storytelling tradition that we need to begin valuing. And I find this very interesting because. In uh, this catalog, the, the word Islam is used, but in none of the stories that I've read do, does the word Islam crop up. It's either true faith, Dine Ibrahimi, or those who believe in one God. In a world where we are confronted with various acts of obliterating the symbolic manifestations of religious and cultural identity of the presumed enemy, the Hamza Nama becomes an important representation of inclusivity. Traces of a diverse history cling to storytelling and invariably find a way into our world and our narratives. As an example, John Saylor's explanation from the catalog of Hamza Nama painting number 73, titled Hamza burns Zardu's chest of armor and breaks the urn with his ashes, reads as follows. Like many legends, the Hamza romance draws freely upon historical personages, events, embellishing some with fanciful details and combining others into instructive, if anachronistic tales. Thus it is that Malik Zardush, known throughout the world as Zoroaster, a major religious leader of 6th century BC, enters the Hamza legend, which ostensibly recounts the exploits of a figure who lived more than a thousand years later. Zardush's role in the realm of the myth, of course, is to personify one strain of religious resistance in Iran to Islam. The caption identifies the subject of this illustration as Hamza emulating the armor chest of Zardush, smashing an urn, presumably containing his ashes on the ground. Zardush's spirit, depicted in the form of a faceless warrior, rises from the flame, flames and dissipates. So, thus, Hamza simultaneously desecrates Zoroastrian fire temple and weakens the fervor of Zardush's followers by obliterating all trace of his physical remains. Zahra Faridini Avan disagrees with Sailor's explanation of the title and the story represented in the painting given Emperor Akbar's worldview. 
She suggests translating the title as Hamza burns Erdo's chest, the daughter of an old hag appears and smashes glass on the ground. Calling sailors translation pure fabrication. Paridhinia Khavan believes that there is no reason to presume the urn contains Zardus ashes. For these to be his cremated ashes, Zardus cannot be associated with Zoroaster, the Persian prophet, who was a fire worshipper and would not have desecrated fire by being cremated. As a side note, this is the same Zardus who appears in Salman Rushdie's Two Years, Eight Months, and 28 Nights as Zabardast. In fact, for those of us who are interested in Rushdie's work, um, and we know the characters from Dastan and Miramza, he uses them all the time. In fact, there have been, uh, we've looked at how Rushdie actually plagiarizes the Dastan form, which is why his work is so popular in the, which, which is called the magic re, magical realist strain of Rushdie, actually comes from the Hamza Nama. In fact, when he was writing this novel, he said in an interview that he was writing a modern Hamza Nama. And yeah, so we know the reasons why that connection doesn't endure. Within the Zardush um, story, the evil of black magic is also the sorcerer's making. This part of the story is told in the text of the Adventures of Amir Hamza as follows. Amir broke down the door and went inside and saw a casket hanging from the ceiling. When Amir brought it down, he saw the corpse of Zardus, the sorcerer, laid carefully within, and it seemed he had just fallen asleep. Amir said, there must be something else in the casket with him as well. We must search it carefully and do so unhurriedly. When Amar Ayar searched for it, he found a book on magic. Amir burned the sorcerer with the book, but Amar had first managed to remove several pages from it. Those pages helped spread magic in the world that has continued to this day. And all those who practice it and have their knowledge, uh, practice it, have their knowledge from those very pages. The question of magic is a rather intriguing one and is illustrative of the fictional narrative of the Dastan, which is not founded on any truths, so to speak, not even the truths of the Islamic story. The story of the existence and beginning of the magic from beginnings of magic from the Quran is as here. They follow instead that which the evil ones used to practice during Solomon's reign, for it was not Solomon who denied the truth, but those evil ones denied it by teaching people sorcery. And they follow that which, come, that which has come down through the two angels in Babylon, Harut and Marut. Although these two never taught it to anyone without first declaring we are but a temptation to evil. Do not then deny God's truth. And they learn from these two how to create discord between man and his wife, but whereas they can harm no one save by God's leave. They acquire a knowledge that only harms themselves and does not benefit them. Although they know indeed that he who acquires this knowledge shall have no share in the good of life to come. For while indeed is that art for which they've sold their own selves, they had but known it. One explanation of the use of the concept of jinn and magic in the Quran has been given by Muhammad Asad and provides an insight into how the Dastan tradition could seamlessly entwine with the religious elements and create a story that had a fictional life of its own. The legendary accounts of Solomon's wisdom and magic powers had acquired a cultural reality of their own and were therefore eminently suited to serve as a medium for the parabolic exposition of certain ethical truths with which this book is concerned, this book, the Quran. And so without denying or confirming their mythical character, the Quran uses them as a foil for the idea that God is the ultimate source of all human power and glory and that all achievements of human ingenuity even though they may sometimes border on the miraculous, are but an expression of his transcendental creativity. According to Asad's exegesis then, the Quran itself made use of the stories that existed within the cultural framework to expound matters of religion, which are fluid and liable to various forms of interpretation rather than fixed in time and character. On to warfare. <laughs> from that. <laughs> Warfare is perhaps the most enduring motive of the adventures. The main purpose of the combat is the conversion of as many 
infidels as possible to the true faith. But the conversions take place as marvels, so to speak. Either the opponent is completely taken aback by Hamza's strength, or there is a prize attached to the conversion. The marvel at the inhuman strength that leads to conversions in the context of the Dastan is perhaps best exemplified in the painting from the Hamza Nama, where Farooq Nijad single-handedly lifts an elephant. This astonishes the onlookers so much that they convert to the true faith. Besides various other stories that depict such marvels by virtue of Prophet Adam's blessing for Hamza, that his hand will never be lowered in combat, even against mighty devs, as in even against mighty devs, there are various other characters in the story who show inhuman might. As an example, notice the following. Farhad seated himself on another elephant and readied for battle, and the prince mounted his horse again. Both of them fought with maces. The prince observed that Farhad dealt the mace like a consummate fighter. He jumped from his horse again and picked Farhad up along with his elephant. Then making his war cry, the prince slammed Farhad and the elephant to the ground and said to him, go send someone else to fight me. For now, you are left with no strength to continue combat with me. Combat is not limited to humans and devs, but includes Hamza's army, pitted against mighty supernatural creatures like leviathans and dragons. In most of these, master trickster Amarayar, his ingenuity and quick wit protects the army of the true faith. As an example, notice the following. As he began to sink, he saw a mighty leviathan awaiting with jo open jaws to make him his fodder. Upon beholding this new scourge, Amar's senses were all disarrayed. But thinking that he would thus forfeit his life for certain, even should he escape drowning, Amar rallied his senses and using the jaws of the beast as leverage, he jumped up and landed on the summit of the obelisk. Crowning all his previous tricks, Amar saw that a timbal was indeed placed there and the name of Sikandar Zulkarnain was inscribed on its head, proclaiming, in the name of Allah, Amar hit it with the mallet, whereupon a most deafening rumble was created. And for 64 leagues, the sea was thrown into a turmoil as a most unearthly sound was produced. All the marine life appeared on the surface and all the seabirds within a circumference of 10 miles suddenly cried and drummed. The wind from the constant fluttering of their wings filled the sails of the ships and they sailed on. Similarly, in this glorious painting from the Hamza Nama, Amar can be seen slaying a dragon with Nafta. While reading the adventures, it is difficult to imagine Hamza as a hero without Amar as his ayar. While and resourceful, deceitful and cunning, Amar is in some ways the real hero. The father of races, the lord of mischief mongers of the world, the king of dragger throwing tricksters, Khawaja Amar Ayar defines Ayari when he says, Ayari is not accomplished in words alone, but has to do with, the, uh, with art and deftness. In this trade, speed is at a premium and alertness and alacrity are its mainstay. Amar's trickery and ingenuity is also guided by the gifts he's been bestowed upon by various prophets, including the invisibility cloak and a zimbi, the famous weightless bag that contains everything that Amar desires. Amar has yet another special gift, a piece of clothing. Buzur Jamid makes Amar wear breeches that lack a cord piece. So there are no paintings with a nude uh, Amar, but this is, oops, sorry. This is how he appears. This is Amar. And in the previous painting, um, this is Amar with his, This might sound diametrically opposed to the discussion we've been having regarding more serious issues dealt with in the Dastan that can be meaningful to conversations about warfare, politics, religion. But it is also important to understand that these stories have no moral or didactic purpose, so to speak. The only rule to be followed is a good story well told, and the Dastan text takes great pleasure in narrating events that include nudity and schatology. The moment that Amar's pants were pulled up, Amar's privates protruded, protruded from, from them. Then Amar said, the generosity of your noble father perhaps could not afford to provide a handbreadth of cloth for the cord piece. 
Thereupon, Bzurj, Bzurj Umid produced a piece of cloth, which Amar saw to be a brocade pouch with flowers and leaves embroidered on it in seven colored silken threads and a priceless ruby hanging from its sash for a button. Bzurj Umid strapped it over Amar's privates and said, this is called an afat band, literally that which <laughs> prevents calamity. Even, um, so, sorry, even in your many generations, nobody has seen or heard of such a garment. Thereafter, instructing Amar in its advantages, Bzur Gumit said, first, your testicles will not be exerted as you run, leap, and gabol. Second, you will not need to undo your drawers before swimming. Amar said, all praise to your father provided a rope for, rope for me and also one for my apparatus. <laughs> Besides two layers of comfortable clothing, Amar is thereafter dressed in a singlet of green brocade and a golden headdress decorated with bejeweled aigrette and filled uh, and fillet and surmounted with an em er em sorry, emerald parakeet whose cavities were stuffed with musk and ambergris to delight the mind in, once it's placed on his head. Not all of these clothing details can be seen in the paintings, but the detailed stories of the gifts Amarayar has at his disposal, disposal make for some hilarious episodes in Dastan, as we might imagine. However, all action in the Dastan world is representative of, sorry, while all action in the Dastan world is representative of the human capacity for leverage, it also believes completely in the fated. Magic exists, but it can never win a battle against what is ordained. The only power it yields is allowed by fate. And we are on to our last story for the day. On their way to Aki, sorry, the conception of Ashkar Devzad is one such miraculous allowance. In an act of reciprocity for the promise of being returned from the land of Kaf to the land to earth, Amir Hamza gets Arnes Dev married to Lanisa Pari on their way to Akik Nigar. And on their way to Akik Nigar, they stop to take rest. When the following happens. When Lanisa grew oppressed by the heat of the place, she cast away her clothes and stepped into the pond to bathe and refresh herself and to find refuge from the heat and reinvigorate her spirits in its cold water. Hardly a moment had passed when a horse resembling a wild bull appeared from the fields and came to stand on the side of the pond. Because its aspect was more strange and frightful, Lenisa was scared by his sight and rushed out of the pond to retrieve her clothes. The horse gave her a chase and the terrified Lenisa fell flat on her back. The horse then took his pleasure of her and satisfied his carnal desire. As God had willed, Lenisa became impregnated in this act. The gardener of fate implanted the seed of an embryo in her womb in that manner and thus showed the marvel of his insuperable power to all his creation. Now that horse was none other than Arnes, and after he re relieved himself and satisfied his lech, he rolled around on the ground and returned to his original form. Be it known that Lenisa would be a occult and a wonder of the progenitor's work would thus become manifest. He would be named Ashkar Devzad and was to become Amir's favored mount and would remain in his service for many a long year and whoever saw him would marvel at his wondrous qualities. Much later in the story, we are introduced to Ashkar Devzad, the red colt with roseate patches on his whole body, running about and galloping in a most captivating, sublime and excellent manner. There were some 400 roseates on his skin and each one was comparable to a thousand roses in full bloom. And he is the one who finally crosses over to the human world with Amir Hamza. Given that the internal unity of the story does not exist in a conventional sense in the Dastan tradition, even what is fated can sometimes falter. But the belief in its stability and the presence sustains the narrative structure of the Dastan. For instance, Hamza is told by Prophet Hizeb that he should know that he is near his death when Ashkar Devzad's horse shoes start giving way. Holy Hizeb said to him, you will have to shoe your horse, otherwise he will not be able to cross the desert of Kaf or journey across the length of the harsh expanse. Khizar then clipped Ashkar's wings and made shoes for him of them, which he nailed to Ashkar's hooves. Amir said, O oh, Holy One, how long will these shoes made of wings last and will they at all be durable? Khizar answered, they will last for the length of your life and won't come off. When the last wing falls off Ashkar's hooves, you should understand that your cup of life 
has become completely full. And your time has come to depart from this world to a future state. However, as it happens in the story, all four of Ashkar's legs are severed by Hinda before her brutal murder of Hamza in the surprise attack. While we recognize this as readers who read a fixed text, the storytellers would never have narrated these two stories in conjunction. Even if the audience heard both stories at different times, they would have known that there are various versions of these stories. This would not have shaken their belief in the power of fate in life or in the story. I would like to end my talk by pointing towards the therapeutic value traditionally associated with storytelling in the genre. One of the stories associated with the beginnings of Tastan Emir Hamza, as quoted in the Persian Kitab e Muzi Hamza, is that the caliphs of the Abbasid dynasty came down with delirium and seven wise men authored the Dastan to be read out aloud day and night till he was cured. Our world today needs healing. And I would have you believe that storytelling spaces are an avenue that are full of potential. Here, meanings can be negotiated, ambiguities can be sustained, varied narratives of history and fiction can exist, and what is more, all on the same page. Thank you all. Hey, so thank you very much, Manu, for this uh, presentation. Uh, it's really wonderful illustrations. It's nice how you incorporated the uh, Hamza Nama. I'm going to done this without the illustrations. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I have, uh, just to start off with, I had um, one of the questions I wanted to pause. First, you know, the term that you're translating is true faith. You know, as you pointed out, that you know, John Saylor translates the Islam. But actually, in the text itself, it says the Dine Ibrahim is the fault of Abraham, which is actually monotheism. So, really, this story is about the monotheistic faith, you know, the, the faith of Abraham. And it's interesting how uh, the modern day conceptions, you know, limited, okay, this is just Islam, but actually it's much broader. But it reminds me of, you know, the similar genres of epics that you find emerging in India, um, where you find this idea of monotheism being extended to not just what today we see as Christianity in today's Islam, but all these figures from um, uh, you know, that are connected with Indian traditions like Rama and Krishna, you know, they're all seen as part of this monotheistic. And in fact, Akbar's grandson, uh, Darashiko, actually wrote about, talked about how the Upanishads were actually absorbed on monotheism. So there's an attempt to actually expand the category of monotheism in India to include this. And so you have epics like um, uh, just like in Bengali, you have this Mangal Kavya, you know, where you have these epics where Krishna and Rama and the Islamic figures, including Hamza and the Prophet Muhammad, are all intertwined in this. But it's the it's the tale of the uh, good verse, those who submitted to God as a monarchies against the, the the enemies and the various deeds and demons and so on. And you also have, uh, as also uh, Aisha Irani has shown in her work on, um, you know, the, um, you know, work on, in, the, in the prophet, you know, it's a Nabi Wamsa. Again, she talks about how this category of who's included in this is much broader than our contemporary notions. And so what is interesting about these genres is they're thinking about this in universal terms uh, and not just what we understand today as Islamic terms, because Islam has come to be narrow what its identity is. But what we're dealing with is a tradition that looked at monotheism in a very broad sense and included all kinds of figures from all other traditions that were, were then seen as monotheism. So, 
it's it's very interesting that even uh, Ram Mohan Roy, you know, who is uh, who's credited with having you know tried to reform Hinduism, uh, he was very familiar with this discourse of the the religion of the monotheists and how because he was familiar with Darashipo's work and he in fact taught a new Persian, so he was very familiar with this tradition. So I'm just wondering whether this this particular genre and it's and the way it's captured the imagination of Akbar, mm -hmm. particularly in his court, was actually part of this attempt to talk about this these ideas in a very broad framework. Um, uh, and and in that sense, you know what you were talking about. What does it have to tell us about Muslim identities today? How they become so narrowed and they're so fixated on Islam as identity and Islam as a boundary marker, okay. especially now between, between Islam and what's considered non-Islam. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, one of the issues of contemporary. That in a certain way, this is actually defined those traditions and saying that, in fact, in the past, we have a tradition of ambiguity. And, and, and that ambiguity is marked by diversity and pluralism. Uh, and whether this, I mean, how the, the whole epic of this can be seen within that framework? Thank you for that question. Um, before beginning to answer that question, I'd like to say that the when I use the word true faith, it is the word that has been used from Shri Fadifaruki in his translation of Dastani Uh the, the Urdu story that I heard as a child used Dine, uh, Dine Brahimi. And I, I, that, I was, I was a new researcher at that time, but that was one thing that that struck me even at the time that I first read the English translation, that it might have made more sense to um, call it um, Dine Ibrahim, but uh, there might have been reasons to not do it. But uh, I've actually never talked to Musharraf about it, but that's an interesting thing that I should bring up perhaps. Um, also, that is, Essential, this this concept that if you believe in monotheism, then all gods or any gods should be that one god. I, I find it a bit disconcerting that if I were to say that I believe in the oneness of God um, and then be so agitated with representations in other cultures of the same deity as as separate from uh, from the one God, um, and it's very interesting uh, when you mention Aisha and Ani. We had the pleasure of uh, hearing her talk uh, the other day at Harvard, and you know how she looks at how manipulation and exaggeration, and how um, the Kisasul Ambia has been drawn into these stories. So there's a whole tradition within Islamic storytelling of telling stories around all the prophets. And that didn't have to be codified. It didn't have to be accurate. You could just bring in everybody. And also like within the Indian tradition, you'd had so much diversity that it would not even bode well for the very, very telling of a story to only tell stories that are, that are rooted in this very confining, you know, cordoned off version of an Islamic story. I, and, and that is something that I feel if we, that's something that drives me up sometimes about how we've begun to tell stories because either a story is sacred or it is profane. There is no sense that stories come from somewhere else. They have like an original beginning. And in fact, Musharraf Ali Faruqi calls it the story tree that all our stories are connected in some ways. And it makes sense to tell whether they're of a religious kind, so to speak, or a cultural kind, they have to be told in a open, more conducive fashion, just to perhaps make the world a better place. Um, if we cordon off our stories, we are cordoning ourselves off, like barbed, barbed wiring ourselves off from the other. And it is, it is with, with everything that's happening in the world, with cancel culture and everything, what are we doing when we don't accept? stories in whatever realm or whatever point of view. I don't know if I answered your question, but those are my thoughts on the 
on on how we should be telling stories. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll just open it up for questions. You know, so please go ahead. Thank you so much, Professor Jenna. Uh, I'm Aruj from Tax History Department, and I love your talk. I found it very enriching and entertaining. I have two questions. I have more, but I'll limit myself to this two for now. So in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the character Koresha, the yeah. half jinn daughter of yeah. Yenkuza. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about how the inclusion of jinns in the Dasan are also then destabilizing the binaries you mentioned between sacred and profane. So I'm interested in, you know, what roles are jinns serving in the Dasan? And second, uh, you gave us the four categories of Razam, Bazam, Kalisam, and Ayari. And I couldn't help but think that perhaps Amir Hamza is being presented as a Sahib Piran, right? Man of the age. But then I couldn't help but think that is this why there's the inclusion of um, uh, Amar Ayar as the trickster? Because in order for Hamza to be Sahib Piran, he can't be, he can't indulge in trickery. So I'm just trying to wonder, like, if Amir Hamza is the man of the age, then he cannot participate in trickery, if that, if that makes yeah. sense. So how, how to negotiate that? Yeah, yeah. That, that negotiation is, is difficult. But yeah. it happened within the story realm, so it happens. But let me start with your first question, which is about Kresha. So um, when Amir Hamza is born, um, the seventh day of his birth, his cradle is put on, on the rooftop of the palace. And he's carried off by the apes to, to the land of the jinn. That is because Emperor Shapal has been told um, that Hamza is the one who's going to quell rebellion in Gaul. So they line his eyes with the colorium of Suleiman so that he's able to see jinn. Otherwise, they are invisible beings and he wouldn't be able to see them. But Hamza's eyes are lined and goes there. And then he gets married to Asman Bari, um, fairy princess. Fairy, fairy style princess as Salman which they call him. But um, yeah, he has a whole, the whole retinue of Hamza stories is in his work. Um, but, and then, so I, for a talk next I'm giving in June, I am looking at the relationship between Hamza and Asman Pari. Okay. And this comes from actually something that I read in Marina Warner's book uh, on the Arabian Nights where she um, looks at at the Syrian treaties. I have not been able to find it. If somebody has any ideas about where to find it, I'd love to hear about it. Where this kind of relationship between jinn and human is actually sanctified within religion, it's a fatwa. So um, you can, again, that can, if you want to, it can move very seamlessly between history and fiction and allowance within the codified injunctions of Islam somehow. And uh, yeah, and also, yes, with Amir Hamza, so <laughs> everything that is, that comes under the realm of trickery, it is sadistic, it is cruel, it is, it is like, for instance, one of the main um, anti-heroes of the Dastan is Bakhtar. And by the end of the story, I should just give you some insight into how by Lamar can be. He eventually what happens is that he gets, you, have you heard the, I think most of us have about the three pigs, how the wolf falls into the cauldron of boiling water. In the same way, Amar makes sure that Bakhtat um, falls into a cauldron of boiling haleem. And then he gives it a good, what we call gota in um, Urdu and, you know, Hindi perhaps, and um, then feeds it to the emperor. And the emperor finds out it's Bhaktak because he finds his stream in the Hashtali. So it is pretty cruel. Um, and, but that all kind of, it's, it's very organic to the text. So you, while you may cringe, you, you know that it's, just the way they're negotiating the storytelling space. Also, the other thing how it's negotiated is that this is a written version that came end of the 19th century. So perhaps we, are, we were not engaging in such um, at the expense of 
not using a better word, but low brow storytelling, which came down to us in the written form in the late 19th century, the courtly tradition had long kind of passed us by. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Subhash Bharat. A couple of questions. One, so the, you said that there was the longer version of uh, yeah. of the text which was made in Lucknow or in Delhi in India. So was that affected? Was it uh, influenced by Indic traditions? And did this tale travel up north to say Uzbekistan and parts of Central Asia? And do they have their own version of the tale? They have their own version. So okay. there's a Malay version, there's an Uzbek version, there's a Persian version, Arabic version. There are many, many versions. We've not even been able to actually, this one volume translation that I work on, we haven't been able to find the original Persian for it, for instance. So um, so this, this in fact, this book that I'm translating right now, Shamsa Rahman Farooqi's Kairi Shahi Sahib Kirani, he looks, he connects it to, um, to the British Empire and says that the because this uh, Dasan and Miramza was presenting a worldview that culturally brought the Hindus and the Muslims and all sorts of cultural and religious traditions of India together and could together have, uh, you know, given a fight to the empire's narrative. It was a very deliberate attempt, actually, at um, on the part of the empire to um, to either ridicule the stories or, you know, uh, abridge them etc etc to actually not allow the collective indian subcontinent to present a worldview that is as strong as the one represented in dastan e miramza the 46 volume version is so sound so it, it includes so i haven't read the 46 sham sarman faruqi sahab was the only one who ever even dared to say that he had um uh, until very recently, it wasn't even found altogether in one place. Uh, it took him 20 years to collect the 46 volumes because they had just dispersed the world over. Um, and um, yeah, I, I wonder if I've answered both your questions. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Of course, uh, not having a fixed text to change, but uh, at least from the version that you're reading, can you tell a little bit about the geography who may be told in the story? Are they related more towards uh, the subcontinent, or can you have um, maybe related to the Arab world or in between, you know, Iran, Central Asia? Do you feel some kind of geographic uh, element? Yeah. So, it, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for that. So, because there's no work being done on Dastan I kind of think that can be a whole project on the Dastan because Amir Hamza travels everywhere. There's no Europe or America, the Americas in the Dastan. But other than that, Central Asia, China, India, Persia, the Arabian Peninsula, down to Sri Lanka everywhere. He crosses over all sorts of land, lands and obviously calf as well. So there's, there, there are a lot of geographical to this uh, painting that I showed from uh, where the yeah, that one uh, and the story that I read uh, with where Amariyar gets to the Ogni skin, you know, sounds the timbal. Uh, that story is from when they're first going to India and they have to cross over like uh, so, so there's a lot of sea crossing or desert crossing or um, a peril that has to be crossed. So, so yeah, geographies are very, very, I haven't looked at them uh, in depth at all, but yes, that's a very, very interesting area of how the Dastan transcends just navigating, um, you know, spaces also, because Amalaya for one can run faster than anybody else, which is where his cord piece comes into play because he runs so fast that otherwise it would be troublesome. Yeah. There are some, uh, obviously, reason for it, but there are some similarities between Alexander and Iskandar from the other parts of the So these are elements. But yeah, all of these uh, get, get in so many different ways, 
the story, so then the local culture, and then moves on. It's, it's, yeah, it's, we sometimes wonder actually with that's my next project. I need to learn how to read. And, mm -hmm. I've recently been told if you to, you are to continue working on the Dastan, you have to learn Persian. So that's like just the next step. But uh, Iskandar Nama is actually one text that uh, we've sometimes thought if the, the Dastan go actually had Iskandar Nama and not Damza Nama. Uh, when he was first writing the Dastan in India, we've also wondered, and I'd, I'd be interested if anybody has any ideas about it, um, uh, the 69 Dastan, the, um, the, I would say the question, but, um, the, you know, the, there's a sense that perhaps they had a copy of that and not, there was no, no Hamza story and they had a copy of Skandar Nam or one of those Dastans and shifted it, you know, called it just, you know, the events of Hamza. Stories, each characters are brought forward to represent something. And so, uh, the martial qualities of Hamza is it something that the authors are thinking and projecting into the society that there's a need for that kind of thing, and as well as the AR, right? That the uh, not formal military, but uh, this type of cookie, uh, escapade type of individuals, you know, drawing from the IRU uh, of centuries earlier. That's one question I have for you. And then expanding, or rather uh, thinking about Professor Asani's questions, that, that, you know, there is this inclusivity and expansion of monotheistic appeal and so on. Aid, who is the appeal to in, in, in terms of the text? Who's the audience? But who, what do you make of uh, the whole construction of Zarathustra and, you know, the destruction of the Yaska. Okay, so thank you for that question. Uh, okay, so um, one for the, um, Amir Hamza as, as a warrior. I, I've never thought of him as representing a need for an army. Uh, I think that's, again, very organic given there's a need for somebody who fights for Nashavans or um, an Amir Hamza just happens to be there. Um, I wonder if anybody would read. So I've, I've written a chapter to how to teach the Hamza Nama in an Anglophone context. And then I wondered if we could use it to talk about how jihad is looked at. Um, but other than that, I do not, within the framework of the story or how I've approached it culturally, I've, I've never thought about that question. Um, secondly, the stories you asked, who do they appeal to? They, they could appeal to the audience. They, the only, <laughs> the only um, thing in the Dastan goes mind was that the audience, the available audience should be the one that the Dastan Go was talking to. So the Dastan goes with narrate stories that we thought this audience would enjoy. So a lot of the extremely, you know, uh, there's very a lot of pornographic material and scatology in the Dastan. And there's been thoughts that this, this was at a time when it was being narrated uh, to uh, only a male audience on the steps of the Jamia Masjid in Delhi, for instance. Or, or in street corners. So there were no women in those. But they were earlier, they were private messages and wetters where it would be narrated to all sorts of audience. So the Dastan goes were very adept at kind of manipulating the story. Um, and that's one way actually I use Freud's essay, where Freud talks about how the storyteller has a, and I quote, a peculiarly directed power on the audience's mind. And the Dastan goes knew it and they and they used it for whichever audience was in front of them. With regard to that first one, I look at something like the Shoei Queen of Galbas or Lord Sarah mm -hmm. Timur, right? That the biographies are recast mm -hmm. to have a representation yeah, uh, and so, you know, where, where is Kamsa being taken into the area? Okay, thank you for that. I'll 
I'll definitely look into that. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, it occurred to me: Could these stories have ever been told with a with a um, intention of dawa, you know, on the part either of the Muslims telling stories amongst other peoples of of the subcontinent, or the other way around? It's, could could people have been trying to persuade each other of the legitimacy of their own traditions? Through these contexts as well. Very interesting question. Thank you for that. I wondered if that is so, but I, whenever I've thought about the question, I've thought not. Uh, the Dasan Ami Hamza, it was like a pre-partition narrative, and I don't think there is there was any sense in in the people telling those Dastans that that Hindus or Muslims were were separate in the way that we think of them today. We were just one people. And within the Dastan, if you see, there's so many intermarriages across different religions, even in the Kissas, the, the shorter uh, Kissas. And there, there are many, there's one book coming out of, you know, a collection of six Kissas by California. In fact, it should be out today. Um, it's called Fabulous Machinery. And you see in all of those Kissas, there is there's so much of harmony, cultural harmony that you see between the different, there is no sense that you cannot be my friend or wife or husband or whoever you are because you belong to a different religion. It's it's very it's taken for granted. The topic is not brought up at all. There is no sense of of uh, Dawat Islam to uh, within the Dastan at all. Uh, it's always monotheism and um, and yes, and that is also for the people who who are, uh, you know, uh, creating trouble. So those who are supposed to turn, you, we converted to the Abrahamic faith or the monotheistic tradition are those who are being troublemaker. If you're not being a troublemaker, it's okay, we can live with you. That's the sense. Uh, it's usually, and it's also like, a, not against a Muslim emperor. It's against, um, it, it can be against a Hindu emperor or a, uh, you know, or a, a Persian uh, emperor or whosoever, like the faith of the emperor or the head of state does not matter as long as you are, you know, submitting to the agency of the state, which is something that we talk about a lot back home. Um, the state is the only authority, really. So no matter where the religion comes from, the authority of the state, the state should be, you know, kept intact. And this question about, I should come back to the first question uh, Professor Asani asked me about monotheism. I've had this conversation because, uh, you know, we, we've talked about Javed Ahmed Ramdi, and he says that repeatedly that when you, when you talk about Hinduism and you talk in this disparaging kind of manner that they have so many gods, you know, uh, I'm sorry if, you know, you're triggering, uh, but, uh, you know, and, and that that sense that when the Quran talks about, um, it says those who believe. And the sense is in, you know, some readings of the Quran that that is for any and everybody who believes in the concept of, of one God. They don't have to be necessarily followers of the Islam in the strict religious identity sense that we look at it today. So I think a lot of what we feel and think and hear is being colored today by what we hear in the news. What has been happening around this kind of religious storytelling, uh, where storytelling has become informed informs identity in, in like a strict cordon of space. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting on that because the word, as you know, Quran commentators have noticed, the word Muslim in the Quran is not Muslim with a capital M. It is just being on the Muslim. You know, so it talks about nature as being Muslim, the birds being Muslim, everything is Muslim. So this idea of submission is much, much broader than you know what we are identifying as Muslims. Yeah. I think we've got one more question. Yeah. The title of the talk mentions the word uncanny. Given the fact that we've not touched on that topic so far. I don't have a precise question, but I'm interested. In knowing this, like I've been trying to read and look at a lot of images from Hamza Ramadan, that inspires my practice as well. 
in a way. So I'm interested, like, what is your take on this idea of uncanny and, you know, the appearance of caves and buddies and its hybrid features within the story of Hamza Naman? How do you look at them? How does normal people or what are the responses of audience back in the 19th century at that point? And then at one point, you also mentioned in your talk that, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's sort of like, is that legal or illegal to marry a buddy and then to give birth to a creature, you know, if like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, just in, like very intrigued by, you know, all these sorts of like different dimensions of the uncleanness, how it operates in the world today, and what are your thoughts about it? Okay. Interesting. So, so, so my, my doctor's music was actually very, very focused on the uncanny and there's, um, I kind of translate as the Ajibo uh in this uh, paper that I've written. But very quickly, so Freud looks at the uncanny and he uses the uncanny as a concept which is so ambivalent because it does not have an opposite. So the opposite of the word uncanny is canny, which in some way means the same as uncanny. So the, the binary does not exist. So anything like deja vu, for instance, would be uncanny because it is strangely familiar. Um, and, he, um, and I quote, he says, uh, the meaning of uh, Hanle develops in the direction of, of um, uh, direction of ambivalence until it coincides with its opposite, unheimlich. And that's where the uncanniness resides in like this in-between space of, of the strangely familiar. So that was one way of looking at it. So uh, because the, the concept of the uncanny is very important to critical theory, uh, to psychoanalysis, and there was no concept of looking at the uncanny from within an Islamic belief setting or a belief setting. And there have been thoughts about how if you are a believer, uncanniness cannot exist for you because everything is explained just like it is in fairy tales or in supernatural stories where you can codify it, codify it and you know put it in a little drawer which says it's supernatural and done. But what do you do if you are a believer in, in the word of the Quran which says that jinn do exist? What does it do to your notions of jinn and jinnah? What does it do to your thinking of the power invested in them? What does it do to your ideas about these? So there's another place, like I, I could share that with you, but that I'm doing for another paper. But um, Muhammad Asad goes into great lengths to explain, that's something that I sent to Yaqub the other day, uh, goes to great lengths to explain. He, in fact, when he translates the Quran, he does not use the word jinn very deliberately. He calls them invisible beings because he says that the Quran used the, used the being from folklore to tell a particular story. It did not mean to use the jinn as, as an entity the way we, we look at the jinn. And it became entwined with the, with the demonic, the dev, uh, in, in folklore. And that is the demonic kind of dev that you see here in, in the Hamzana. They just, it just, it, it is a measure of Hamza's prowess that he can fight both dave like characters on earth. And so, yeah, so, and they're so huge. They're shown as uh, Amir Hamza, uh, you know, puts his dagger through the uh, dave's uh, foot uh, to wake him up because he feels that I'll, I'll not kill somebody who's sleeping. So he wants to wake him up. And you know how the dev wakes up because he's driven his dagger through his foot. The dev thinks it's a fly that's irritating him. So you see the kind of, and he wakes up because he, you know, uses some expletives for the fly and says, and moves on and then it's Hamza and he still, you know, is able to kill the dev. So it becomes like that sense with, with it's Hamza's power granted by God. Uh, and then the second way I look at it is through the power of the story teller. So there are two ways. So there's the directive powers of the storyteller um, that are uncanny. They can, Freud says that they can, the storyteller can dam up emotions in one direction and make them flow in another direction. So that's a lot of that is happening. So in various ways, the essay on the uncanny 
the bone sliding. Well, the best time. Thank you very much. Yeah, just a quick question. Is there one question? Uh, I can ask afterwards, but but I just just thought that I you know I, I sort of um, want to ask that. So, where you, you come from an English literature background and yeah, from this, do. how does that background inform this research? Okay, so uh, very thank you, Yaku, for that question. That so so to, like the storytelling mode of uh, how I got to it, and I I must say this out loud. So, um, I wanted to do a PhD in literature, religion, and philosophy. That's really what I wanted. And my supervisor said to me, and again, I told Professor Asani this. He said, what are you going to do with that? Because do you know what will happen? It, it was very mechanical. He said, do you know what will happen? What will happen is you will be writing one thesis for the philosophy department, one thesis for the literature department, and you will never be able to submit because who do you go to? And I was okay. He said, just follow your, your path because I've done an MA in critical theory and, and, and an MA in language and literature. So he said, see, this is my daughter putting on a duck alarm. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I, sh I should really just, uh, anyway, <laughs> so she had to be present in some form in this talk, I think. <laughs> so um, so I said, okay, I, I'll just do the, it doesn't matter anything. So we started looking at what to find, like we look at the text to look at, and we thought about fairy tales, and then it was no, like, I don't want to do like English fairy tales. I why, why should I only do English fairy tales? Let's look at the Arabian Nights. And then I go towards the Arabian Nights, and my God, the amount of work done on the Arabian Nights is crazy. And you know, when you're starting out on your PhD, so there's no coursework in England. Uh, so you just go directly to writing your PhD. Um, and it, it gives you a lot of angst now that you're a PhD student, you should know what you're doing with your life, right? And in that terrible, you know, state of guilt and anger and resentment towards my supervisor, find something, I go to sleep and I dreamt that I should do it. And then I ordered Musharraf, so I wrote, write an email to Musharraf, uh, Musharraf Ali Faruqi. I didn't know him, write an email to him and he replies saying, uh, I'll say, can it be done? He replies saying, I didn't know him. He's why the hell not? And I get the book, the translated version of Dasa Nemi Hamza. And in the introduction, Mashari Faji Faruqi translated Dasa Nemi So um, apparently, I have this uncanny sense that Dasa Nemi Hamza characters don't want to die. They a lot of mistakes. Um, and yeah, and the rest is history, really. <laughs> Um, so, 